Welcome to the middle of the African bush. What a way to start the pre-dawn sunrise safari. And we've got the Inkahuma Pride and we are following them live through the African bush on Safari Live. Good morning and welcome to the Sunrise Safari and yet again we're having an Inkahuma sunrise and wonderful to be with the lions and all the cubs. Lots of playing going on, it's always great to be with the lions in the early morning because they are going to be a lot more active. My name is Brent and I've got VM on camera. On the other vehicle we have Steph and Brian, or no, Steph and Dave actually. And then final control, Louise and Kirsten. Oh, look, we're being stalked. Hello. Look at this. This is just too special. iPhone orbs just make the way. Well, Ali, indeed, we have had lions, lions, lions everywhere. So, Ali, it has been incredible. Unfortunately, they've been making themselves quite vocal. So that's how we've been finding them. They've been roaring. Now, it doesn't look like they were successful in catching anything last night. <laughs> oh, serious little battle going on here. <laughs> Can't get away, just keeps getting caught. And here comes the amorous male and the youngest in Kuma. Now, look, she just wants to greet the females, and this could cause a bit of havoc. See, see how that they try to keep away from him, and she. He's not letting that youngest female out of his sight. Can you hear that little? A deep growl from the male. <laughs> oh. 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 Mom 
getting a bit upset, thinking that's a bit rough. Okay, it wasn't that incredible. So what happened is the youngest lioness uh, was getting a bit rough with one of the cubs. Mom stepped in and uh, the male was of course sticking with that youngest lioness because she's about to come into estrus. And uh, then he just caused a bit of havoc there. So nothing too serious. Um, the female, even though she was snarling, growling, she got on her back quite quickly, showed a submissive st stance. Now. What it did let us know is where the second male is, because suddenly behind us, there's another male somewhere just off here. We could hear calling behind us. It's amazing, something like that just set, set off a, a bout of vocalization. Looks like they're going to get on the move. So we're going to move around and see where they go. And while we do that, let's go say good morning to Steph. Isn't that amazing what you were having a look at at the morning? Lions roaring straight at you. That's pretty epic. Well, it is a good morning from us. It's uh, myself, Steph. And I've got Dave on camera today, and we are standing on quarantine, listening to that ruckus that is happening where Brent is, and you were just now, and we are waiting for the sun to rise. We've decided to only clutter our horizon with one tree this morning, as much as what we're trying not to. And, uh, and we're waiting for the dawn to come. It started off when we left this morning with this absolutely orange sky. I really can't even explain to you how brilliantly orange the sky was this morning, but it's starting to turn this yellow color, and I'm sure the sun is a couple of minutes away from rising. But in any case, we're looking forward to a good day. I don't know what's out there at the moment. We've had these lions keeping us awake for most of the evening. They seem to have been camped up around the camp this morning when we woke up and peeked outside the camp when they were roaring. It seemed like they were roaring right outside our kitchen, and there were footprints all over the camp. The lions have been going around and around the camp the whole night. Makes you think about day, well, about walking around in your sleep. Eh? But the idea today is uh, is a, a leopard day. I'm gonna. We've got Herbert back. He's been off sick for a little bit. We've got Herbert back, and he's busy combing through the bush at the moment, looking for signs of Karula coming back into into Juma. And I think that it's a nice thing to look for. Hey? Some leopard. But we've also got a request. David hasn't seen a elephant in a long, long time, and so we might see if we can follow that heard from yesterday. So that's the plan. I don't know what's going to happen. As usual, the best laid plans are almost always and invariably derailed at some point. But we're going to try anyway. But for now, we're going to wait for the sun to come and peek up above the horizon. It looks like that that is exactly where the sun is going to come up. And have a look at just the most bizarre. This tree featured very heavily in our Bush Olympics, so it holds quite a nice memory for all of us. It was the twig that provided some shade relief during the, the whole episode. Yes, the sun is definitely going to rise up there. You can see the sort of, you can see it getting more intense just to the right hand side of that stem. Here we go. And that's what we're going to be having a look at. So far, all I can hear around us 
are a couple of grey-headed sparrows and a bearded woodpecker that's busy drumming on his branch somewhere down in the valley in front of us. I haven't heard much else, I must be honest with you. A couple of hornbills, maybe. Oh, and we had a flight of hardy dar ibis that came over us just before you joined us live. I'm sure Brent has already met, re reminded you about this. But you're welcome to ask us questions by emailing questions at wildearth.tv or by sending your comments and questions to the hashtag Safari Live. And on that note, Brent is still with those lions and it'll be a good time for you to go back to him. Yeah, so they are moving about a bit. A male still trying to keep up with that young female who just wants to play. Get a little bit closer. There she is. It does really look like she's trying to get rid of him, but he is sticking to her like glue. She just wants to play with the cubs. Trying to figure out where they're going to go next. There's no real order at the moment, they're just scuttling about, and all the movement is caused by that male and female. Now, Lisa is wondering why the lions are staying around this area. Is it because there's water? Well, at least I think it's probably because there's quite a lot of food around here and that could also be because of the water. So there's a lot of old buffalo bulls, and zebra, so lots of prey species around so therefore the lions haven't felt the need to, to move on yet. So we're just trying to figure out where to go next. Oh, this lioness is up. I thought they might move south but now it looks like they might move north. Cubs are just running around, being nonsenses, all around that termite mound. Can't see where the male and female have gone. What do you think, Vim? Should we get a bit closer again? Okay. 
Morning, morning. Well, we get into a better spot. Let's go have a look at that magnificent sunrise with Steph. Welcome back. Yes, and the sun has just cracked the horizon and look at that. Just unbelievably bright. It's so bright at the moment that I actually cannot even look at it without hurting myself. So I'm looking at it through my, my pinched fingers. You're looking at it through a filter or two. Here we go. Or three. <laughs> just so that you can stare at it as well. That's just creeping up hidden by that marula tree. It's just incredible how fast it actually rises. Just every single time we see the sunrise and it's most mornings most evenings i take some time to watch the sunrise and greet the day and it just sort of never astounds me how quickly that sun breaks the horizon and then rises up into the sky and how with us moving back towards the equator so how well, how, as the sun moves across the equator, how some distance makes it last that much longer. I mean, the sun will start to rise earlier and earlier. I think the sun rises at its earliest here, probably around about, or well, it's light around about 10 past 4, or quarter past 4 in the morning. And will set again, probably, I don't know, Dave, what time does it set? Half past 7, the latest, I think? It sets about half past 7 at the latest. And you can't think to yourself, how, if the sun is moving that quick, like how big is this planet of ours? And Dave and I were just chatting. He's just been on a recent holiday all the way to Europe and managed to do some of the most amazing cities, Amsterdam and Edinburgh and London, all in one trip. So can't think of three different places to go in one small place. And, yeah, and he says the sun only goes down there at half past ten. And here we are moaning about the fact that in summer our sun goes down at seven. <laughs> so Anna Marie, you've just commented on the fact that the sunrise is amazing. I agree totally with you. You know, there it is trying to hide itself behind that marula tree, not doing a very good job at it. But it is amazing. You are right. And once again, I, I, for some odd reason, I have this sense of anticipation and excitement that has bubbled up in me as the, the, the sun has risen. Probably fine, I'm a bit pre-programmed to this sort of thing. I'm excited about seeing what's going to happen with the day. What are we going to see next? What is Herbert finding tracks of? How's his brain thinking? What are those lions going to do? Is something going to come down to the pan? You know, have, has that zebra we were looking at, at last night, has she had her baby foal last night? All these things are running through my mind. And of course, we don't really know. Who knows what, by this evening when we do our closing, who knows what's going to happen, eh? Oh, that is lovely. Andrew, you've, uh, or you've commented on the fact that after hearing the lions roaring and then you've, you've, uh, you've asked uh, what other animals keep us awake at night. Andrew, I'd say hyena are, hyena are the ones that keep us awake uh, most, but you get used to them. And I'd say that probably close, a close second would be elephant, elephant in camp or around camp breaking branches and shuffling through the leaves definitely do wake me up. And I know a couple of other members of the team as well. Kirsty has mentioned, James has mentioned, um, elephants keeping them awake, Geraldine. And I'm talking about hyena in the camp, busy biting through our dustbins and rummaging in through the kitchen scraps to see if they can get anything to eat. Not them whooping on their roads. Um, and then after that, what would it be, Dave? Nothing except for hyena and elephant. Yeah. Nothing except for hyena and elephant there. And lion, of course, when they're around camp. And then, excuse me, and then on the odd occasion when Tingana or Mvula visits the lodge, Tingana, for some odd reason, just loves to rasp and roar and does so every couple of minutes 
for his whole circuit around the camp. So that definitely wakes me up from time to time. He also comes very close to the camp. Just look at that. Star of the show. The scraggly looking marula tree. <laughs> Oh, that's lovely. All right. Now that the sun has risen and we've got our game plan set, sort of, um, I think we can safely say, go back to Brent and uh, we're going to carry on and see what we can find for you. So we're back in amongst the pride at the moment with cubs, females and the adults are just wandering around, all trying to avoid that male and female. Look at that! <laughs> Recalcitrant old bag. Now there's an interesting handle. Uh, well, a big welcome to you. And recalcitrant old bag would like to know, do cubs in the same litter possibly have different fathers? Yes. So even all three cubs in the same litter, it's possible for them to have been sired by different males. That is the most fun bush in the whole Sabi Sands at this very moment. Cubbies, cubbies everywhere. <laughs> Ooh, that one looks like he's got serious swagger. Now, as I said, it doesn't look like, oh, incoming, no, decided against it. And it doesn't look like they caught anything last night. And definitely from all the noises last night, they were hunting. And that little bush still providing ample entertainment. Michael is saying, it seems like everything in the bush makes an excellent toy. <laughs> there we go. If you're a lion cub, and that is definitely true, Michael. The exuberance of youth. That's a, quite a wobbly little perch that guy's got there. Could we see a tumble? Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Sometimes it's nice to just sit quietly and, and enjoy.
good games. Oh, Cubs back in the tree as well. Try getting a better spot for that. Uh, Lev Lev says, I think adult lions spend all their time sleeping uh, to make up for all the time they spend playing as cubs. Well, the joy about being a cub is that your body weight is not too much, so you don't get as hot as easily. Like they are on the move again. While we try and get around, let's go see what Steph's up to. The moment we've decided to turn ourselves into polar bears, it's decidedly freezing on Twin Dabs Road today, and my one claw-like hand that's holding the steering wheel, <laughs> I don't quite know how, to, how else to say it, it's freezing. I think I'm absolutely not going to drive down the Mulwati anymore. I'm going to cross it and go back up to warmer climbs. It's uh, So we're just going to be crossing through the through the Mulwati right now, I'm going up onto the other side and seeing if we can find a warm patch. It's like being in a swimming pool at the moment where you are flitting from warm patch to warm patch. So let's cross here quickly. Other than that, I'd love to know how it's going with all of you this morning, wherever you are. You're welcome to send through some comments and I'll share it with everybody. Dave and I are having a nice chat and a catch-up. It's the first time we've had to sit down properly and have a chat since he came back from his leave. And it's just added a nice sort of atmosphere, friendly atmosphere to everything. Ah, one thing I do want to do today that I want to share with you, I want to spend some time looking for a weeping boar bean tree that is in flower today. That I think is a must do. I think when it warms up a little bit more, not now, I will put Wendy into the Mulwati and we'll go for a drive down the riverbed to see if we can find a flowering weeping boar bean tree to share with you. I am wanting to go there for the bird life and for the insect life that it attracts. And I'm almost certain that somewhere on this reserve there has to be one. We found Tambuti flowering, knob thorns are obviously flowering. Funny enough, we haven't seen any tree wisteria or shambok pod yet. Um, but I'm not really, I'll, I'll wait until I see one. I'm not really wanting to see one of those just yet. As pretty as what they are, I'm wanting not to diversify myself too much. So we'll be looking for weeping bourbon today. Birdie, all the way from Georgia, you've asked me, do I have to deal with any parasites out here? Where you are, you've got assassin bugs and a whole bunch of things. Uh, yes, Birdie, I have to. Uh, we deal with two things here, or three things here that are, are nasties. My favorite and most common one being ticks. Um, little parasites, blood-sucking parasites that we have here, they're just on every grass stalk, it seems. And as a 
trails guide walking around here ticks are what cover me most and most often. The second one that we have to deal with is mosquitoes and while there are no clouds of mosquitoes here, we do have mosquitoes that carry malaria and so it is a bit of a worry for me with everyone in camp. We've got to try and protect ourselves from malaria and from getting sick from malaria. Um, but really you only have to worry about malaria itself. Oh, how bright is that sun? <laughs> Give me Chinese eyes over here. Making my ears pull up all funny and then my earpiece falls out. <laughs> um, and um, the third one that we have to deal with it is the ever-present fly. Now, while they're not really parasites, we do have some blood-sucking flies here. They are parasitic to my mood. So they suck away my good mood and can ruin a good feeling day by flying around my face in their clouds. So those are the three things that we have to deal with over here, is ticks, mosquitoes, and flies in that order, basically, from nuisance generating. Right, now I've swapped one drainage line for another and my hand is still not getting any warmer. Just hovering just above freezing at the moment. <clears throat> Probably a couple of degrees centigrade above freezing. Nine, ten degrees it feels like at the moment. And this cold band of air that we're driving through is exactly what precipitates the dawn chorus. Please excuse my mouth isn't working so my lips have become... <laughs> rubbery. Um, what precipitates the dawn chorus? So air during the day rises and then as soon as the sun goes down this air starts to cool and to settle. And what it does is it fills up the hollows and fills up all the low places and as more air uh, starts to basically starts to push it down you get this layer forming this very very stable layer that forms very close to the earth and because of the different density that it is to the air above it, what happens is, is birds use that density to bounce sound. Lions bounce their sound, leopard bounce their sound in this thinner band of air. It's not a column of air up into the sky, it's a thin band of air and it makes sound travel much, much further. And that is why we have a dawn chorus and that is why at sunset or just after we have all the animals vocalizing together. Let's see, being here where I am, let's see if we can hear. So we've got some mouse birds, we've got a ox, we've got a bull, black eyed bull bull, we've got a fork tailed dronga, an ox pecker, white bright scrub robin. Also given me some time to warm up my hand, my claw, <laughs> just rub it on my knuckle. <laughs> oh, it is chilly today. We've got some oxpeckers calling here. It doesn't sound like they're calling from a nest. They're maybe calling. Ah, <laughs> yes. Look through that gap there, Dave. You'll see something standing in the drainage on there if you can. It's about here. Right through that tree here. You'll see. Let me yeah, focus through there and you will see a, let me go forward a bit, there you go, that's oh. what the ox pickers were sitting on, oh. <laughs> that giraffe is standing in the drainage line, lower than what we are at the moment, we're actually looking down on him, that's what the ox pickers were standing on, how amazing is that, it's through this little window in the bush. That's all we can see. He's probably about a hundred yards away from us at the moment. Why he's in this deep drainage line can only be food. He wouldn't be here because it, 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 he's getting warmer. He wouldn't be in there for the protection it affords him. Giraffe are tall and interlocking branches will create a hazard for him. So he literally, I think, is just in there for food. That is it. And the ox pickers found him for us. Isn't that amazing? I don't know, one of the most bizarre shots of the giraffe is when you are able to look down on top of them when they're standing next to you. That is exactly what's happening here. Chewing the cud. So 
So giraffe are ruminants. And so watch what happens. He's going to chew a bit. And then he's going to stop chewing. And you'll see that bolus of food go down his throat. You'll probably be able to see it just uh, where, his, where his jawline goes into his throat. You'll see this bolus going down there. There he goes. Let's see if he... No. And then he'll regurgitate something into his mouth. Here it comes. There we go. <laughs> How disgusting is that this early in the morning? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so what he's doing is he's basically using his teeth to grind into smaller pieces the food that he ate during the night and yesterday. And what that does is it increases surface area and so it increases uh, the area that microbes can work on the food and break it down making their digestive system more efficient, but also slower. And so that's why ruminants lose such fast, or lose conditions so fast during the dry season, is that their digestive system is just too slow to cope with the volume of food that these animals need to eat. And that's why things like buffalo and impala and wildebeest, and to an extent giraffe, always lose condition at the end of, at the end of winter, at the end of our dry season. And why things like Hippo and zebra and elephant and warthog always seem to be a little bit fatter and more plump. Is they are capable of eating a larger volume of food. Let's see if we can see that bolus go down one more time. I mean, a good time over there, this giraffe. Now they normally go into what the, what we call a ruminating posture. He's still chewing. The ruminating posture is best described as that posture that cows lie in when they're chewing their cud. If you've ever visited a dairy and seen cows lying with their feet curled up, ah, here he goes, he's on the move. That is the ruminating posture. And giraffe do quite often go into that ruminating posture. Why this giraffe? Debra, you've just commented that the giraffes are your absolute favorite animal. Well then, Debra, I dedicate this giraffe to you. This, this morning on this particularly cold, fine day, I dedicate this giraffe all to you. Now I've managed to stop where I completely obliterate that giraffe for you. <laughs> Sorry, David. Let's see if we go a bit more back, if we can see it for Debra. That's not bad. There we go. such fine placement of this car as you can see we're literally trying to place this vehicle through the twigs very bizarre seeing a giraffe in 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 such deep bush at the bottom of a drainage line basically on the sand of this particular riverbed you can see how wary he is definitely a male you have a look, look right at the tips of his horns or his Aussie cones as they're called it's bald. Him and I share a similar liking for sun cream and moisturizing, I'm sure. Oh, Erica, you've just asked me a nice question. You've, <clears throat> all the way from Latvia, um, you've asked me how long did giraffe live? That's pretty easy to answer, around about 30 years. But then you've asked me, how many babies can giraffe have in their lifetime? Now, let me just think about when a giraffe has babies for the first time. I may have to go into my reference books to confirm this, but let me say that giraffe females will have their first calf between two and four years old. Let's, let's leave it as wide as what I can there. So between two and four years old, they'll have their first calf, and they'll have a calf every two years from there. So 30... Uh, take off four years to get mature, so we're going down to 24. Take off another couple of years for just lions and hyena and dangers out here, so we go down to um, a nice even number of 18 um, years of, of, of productive life, and then divide that into three just for the odd calf that doesn't want to wean too much. Um, divide that into three, so what does that give us? Five, three goes into 18, just my maths when my brain is cold like this. Uh, for five, uh, six times. 
<laughs> That's terrible. So six times, um, she'll have six calves in her life and then take off maybe one or two for lions. Um, so they'll probably have about four. So I would say that a, a giraffe will have anywhere from three to six calves in their lifetime, if that makes any sense. Just a quick sort of equation there for you. Three to four calves in their lifetime. You're welcome to, or three to six. You're welcome to, to, the, to obviously try and... Um, Try and let us know what that is and share that comment to us on the hashtag Safari Live or through emails, the questions at wildearth.tv. But I don't think that we're too far off between three and six. <clears throat> Alrighty. <laughs> Deborah, I'm so glad that I've made your day. Let's see if we can do it again at some point. So on that note, and while we get out of the Arctic that we're driving around in here, and I can wipe my nose uh, properly, we're going to send you through to Brent with those lions. So it's quite difficult. We've only got visual of two at the moment, oh, and one cub. The rest are spread out through this very broken area. So the elephants have pushed over lots of trees, and we can't even sneak through it. And there we go, there's some more cubs there. And we've got one lioness lying in the light. Looking quite content, if I do say so myself. Eritus Fox would like to know, do lions recognize each other, recognize each other by sight and scent? Uh, I would say yes to both. And uh, the second part of the question is if they split into two different prides, would they recognize each other as friends? They would for a certain amount of time, but if those prides split for a very long time, and then unfortunately, or fortunately, depending, they would become separate prides and, and fight with each other. And I have seen that before. So it looks like they're up. We've got one little rascal still next to us. We can hear some disagreements happening in the distance between the male and the other lioness. You can see ears up, listening to what's going on. Oh, cubs on its way. Uh, they have chosen one of the more impenetrable blocks that we have on Juma. We will try to stick with them. Uh, and she's up as well. So we're going to go do a bit of bundu bashing uh, while we do that. Let's go catch up with Steph. You have no idea how those few words make me cringe. We're going to have to do a bit of bundu bashing with Brent Leo Smith in Rusty. All I'm experiencing in my head now is spanners, spare parts, trailers. <laughs> the Leo Smith artwork on one of our vehicles. <laughs> now we are about to approach Buffles Hook Dam. I don't know, it was just a comment that David made. Uh, we need to go to Buffles Hook and go and see what's floating around in the mud cesspool that is left there at the moment. And it was a good suggestion because <coughs> Louise, 
Louise just commented that if it makes me feel better, better, Brent is being very careful. Thanks, Louise, but I doubt that. <laughs> So, Buffalzook Dam is a couple of days away from being dry and in actual fact, I highly doubt that we see anything when we get there. It may have that hippo from Voyatella Dam in it again. That hippo has the bizarre, bizarre habit of swapping between the two when the Voyatella Dam is a far better proposition. But let's go and see there in any case. I think it is going to be quite interesting to see what has managed to make itself a home there. Even the birds have moved on. The hippo, if you wouldn't mind just repeating that, Louise, I heard something about the hippo and Voya Telepan. Ah, so R Raccoon Pet, good, good morning Raccoon Pet, um, you've said that the hippo that was in the pan last night returned this morning with an injury of some sort. That's quite interesting, I wonder where you managed to get that. I can only imagine it's from another hippo, they quite often do, especially in times like this, will quite often injure one another quite badly. But it could also have been the fact that those lions, having been around the camp the whole night, maybe gave him a little bit of a go. Um, that would be quite interesting to see how bad it is, you know, what, to what extent. Was it made by tooth and claw or was it made by one of those massively sharp incisors that these hippopotamus have? Um, but yeah, hippo, 50% of all the hippo that are born in an area end up being killed by other hippo. They are incredibly aggressive toward one another for all the fact that they are contact species. Big male hippo don't tolerate smaller male hippo like the one that we have here. Not very easily anyway. And it would be interesting to see what happens there. They've got a lot of meat on them as you can see. So it's generally speaking they they repair up quite well. I think the 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 worst I've ever seen a hippo injured was um, a, a female that was trying to protect her calf from, a, from an older male and he just bit her across the back and was literally had lacerated her with cuts this deep, uh, this, this long and easily this deep all the way through. And she was stiff for a few days and then ended up recovering almost 100% with the exception of a few scars. So they're quite tough animals. If he's moving about and he's still able to feed himself, then hopefully he gets better. So Erica um, from Latvia, you've asked me which is the slowest reproducing animal that we find in Africa. I would have to say probably one of the whales, Erica, as in terms of actual time spent uh, with calf inside gestating. Um, although on, on land or terrestrial it would have to be the elephant at 22 months. Can you imagine being pregnant for 22 months? Followed after that by rhinoceros at about eight, 16 months. And then funnily enough, even though they're the same weight, can you believe it? A hippopotamus is half. So a hippopotamus is eight months. And the reason for that is because they're suspended in water and it's easier for the calf to grow. Isn't that amazing? Um, and then slightly longer than a hippo would be a buffalo at 12 months. Giraffe also 16 months. So yeah, elephant at 22 months. And then, although I don't know this for a fact, it would probably be whales as the longest and here are the biggest whale that visits our shores is the southern right whale um, as far as I know one of the largest whales that we find and here is Buffalo's hook as predicted not much going on but I think let's give it a little bit of time let's give it the benefit of the doubt and let's go a little bit closer to the mud and see what exactly is flitting around over there? And while we get ourselves into a nice spot and see what is here, let's send you back to Brent with those lions. We'll catch up with some news in a little bit.
So we've lost the rest of the pride, but we've still got the single male who's take, keeping up the rear. Now, at the moment, the other male who's growling and trying to keep that little lioness to himself appears to be dominant. Now, this guy could be playing a very smart move. So you can see he looks a bit better fed and uh, that lioness isn't quite ready to mate yet. So what happens sometimes is these male lions will literally wait, let the other guy do all the chasing and utilize a lot of his energy and uh, growling, chasing lions, fighting. You can see he's quite a bit skinnier than this one at the moment. This guy's looking uh, nice and well fed. And then as soon as she's actually ready to mate, he'll step in there, beat up his coalition mate and take the first mating rights. So it could be the fact that he's playing the smart game. Now, of course, this doesn't happen every single time, but it is frequent enough that, uh, or in my experience that I've seen, that this I, th I think he's playing uh, the, the smart patience game when it comes to mating. Oh, I can hear a crow calling above us. You see some zebra. Awesome. Yeah. BM's spotted some zebra behind the lines. Are you going to go hunt it by yourself, big boy? Looks like he's going to try. Yeah, exactly. As Vim says, I don't know where he's going to put it with a belly that size. reposition to see where he's going. We're not going to stick to him too closely if he is hunting. Now this is quite a good area and maybe he is going to go dispel the myth that male lions don't hunt and let the lioness do all the huntings. Male lions do a lot of hunting by themselves because they are away from the pride uh, while they're patrolling a lot. So the zebra we're moving that way, he's cut that way. So we're not going to stick right behind him in case we interfere. He's moving quite quickly. Okay, there he is. Now, oh, could he be getting into a good position that the zebras sort of stumble onto him? Watch, I'm just trying to plan where to go next. Okay, let's go. I know where more or less where he's going, and there is a road up ahead. I just want to see if we can get a view of the zebras, see where they're going. Now believe it or not, I've seen a male lion take down a near adult giraffe by itself. So taking down a zebra, as long as you can get close enough, is uh, not out of uh, the question. So also, one of the reasons I'm making my way back to the road is that less bashing and crashing, we're less likely to distract the zebra or, or bring attention towards the lion. So, where would you say? I'd say the zebras cross somewhere around here, Vim. Now, I didn't quite see what they were. I think Vim spotted them before me. Um, I think, actually, Vim is it. There he is. No, it's another male lion. I think one other lioness that came through. It's, I think it could be Amber. Ah. OK. 
Okay, there we go. I think it might have been the amber-eyed lioness, there she is. So Sally in Oregon is wondering why they try to isolate, the males try to isolate, isolate the females from the rest of the pride. And she says, understands why they wouldn't want another male around. Well, Sally has distractions and, and the male lions just are, are programmed to eat, breed and fight. So that's what they're doing. Is that Amber? I can't really see. Must be. She was the only lioness we didn't couldn't see earlier. She might have been on her way to join the rest of the pride when he spotted her. Just waiting to see what happens here. He might lie down next to her. Or not. <laughs> not interested. <coughs> oh, again, the Inkahumas are providing us with just the most magic lion sightings at the moment. Now, Michael's wondering, between the sticks in the Inkahumas, which ones have the Birmingham boys spent more time with? Um, well, Michael, up until now, I would probably say it has been the... They've spent more time with the sticks, but uh, at the moment they seem to be spending a lot of time with the Inkahumas. Well, Safari Hayes said that Birmingham boy looked like her bodyguard watching over her while she sleeps. I think he was just checking her intention and that she wasn't very interested. Now, let's have a look. Is that Amber Eyes, Vim? Looked like it. Let's look at us, please, madam. Let's try to get her. Now, he's moved off and he's laying down just in the distance there. We can't really make out where he is. Let's go have a look. Yes, that's definitely Amber. As she looked at me, you could see those beautiful eyes. So, 
while the lionesses aren't pregnant, uh, they do come in and out of estrus quite regularly, and that does uh, cause great excitement amongst uh, the male lions. But once they are pregnant, uh, they will generally become non-receptive to mating. Uh, there are, of course, some strange things that happen. Sometimes, um, even with, if she's pregnant, some of those hormones uh, confuse the males a little bit, so they think she might be ready for mating, even though she is not. But uh, generally, once mating, once she is pregnant, that's that's the end of mating, till those cubs have become independent. And uh, Shamsung was actually wondering about that. Lauren says, I think Amber Eyes would make a terrific mother, and she seems to be in great condition. Uh, indeed she does, Lauren. All the Inkahuma lionesses are looking fantastic at the moment. But I do agree, I think she'd be a fantastic mom. They're just doing a little bit of morning grooming. So while things are calm here amongst the big cats, let's go see how Steph's endeavours are faring. Welcome back. And we had to leave before so damn. There was just one lonely little three-banded plover that was pecking around in the mud and we heard some elephants screaming from where we are right now. Now we're on Bivol's of cut line and there was, it just sounded like a calf a scream, not getting enough milk from his mom or being chastised in some way. But I think they have gone over the boundary here to be quite honest. I think they are in Bivol's hook. But we're just going to, I think, take this road. This is Bivol's of cut line and see if we don't get either the front end or the tail end of this particular herd in here. We're looking for some tracks, some old elephant tracks that have come over on these game paths towards the mud. Not much happening at Bifelzook. There was something that walked through the mud yesterday. It looked like either a hippo or an elephant had walked into the mud and then walked out the bank, but none of that characteristic dish shape, wallow shapes and that'll pretty much signify the end of the water in Bifelzook Dam for now. As soon as you get those, a rhino or a buffalo or a, a hippo or an elephant, scoop out the side and it plasters the last little bit of moisture around the side of the dam and then that's that. And then the next rain that we can expect will probably be around about the 1st of September. Ah. So, um, Enya from Finland, you just asked when can we expect rain to ease the drought and we'll get our first rain uh, in around about September, I think, um, but it'll be a spattering of frontal rain. It's not going to be anything major. We call major rain here anything over 20 millimeters, anything over that much and I expect the first rain over 20 mils to be here around about October the 10th. I think James and I share the same bet on October the 10th and then Brian's got a bet for the 15th of September I think. So Brian, Brian has taken it a whole month early and being the, ah sorry Brian's the 20th of September, I thought he was the 15th but still, it's still in September. But David has decided that it's the 18th of September. Okay, so we've got an elephant there in the distance. There, far away there. I think it's an elephant. Let me just double check. 
before we zoom in on the naughty, yeah, it's an elephant. Right. Done. So, we are going to go and find that elephant. I think that he's close to a road there. <laughs> Not driving as much as what I do. It was always a difficult thing to decide where exactly these animals are. But I think that he's going to be close to a road. <laughs> be able to get, close, get you there. Doesn't look like a particularly big one. If I were to say that we are most likely going to encounter a herd of elephant there rather than a single bull. But nevertheless, let's give it a bash. And then see. <laughs> Jenny, you've asked me if I... Is, if, is there truth to the rumor that I burn elephant dung to keep mosquitoes out of my room? Um, I do burn elephant dung. There are, it is a fantastic fly repellent. I generally burn it when I'm in the car and I have made a little tin. I'll tell you what, I'll bring, I'll bring the tin with on safari to this afternoon and I'll burn some elephant dung for you so you can see what it looks like. It will be difficult to describe what it smells like to you, but we're going to try our best. It does create a bit of a fuzzy frontal lobe feeling. But that being said, this is the best time of the year to burn elephant dung because they're eating so many species of woody plants. And it's the woody plants that have all the compounds in it, all the medicinal compounds, the bark and the root in particular, um, are very high in concentrations of these medicinal herbs. So I don't think it would be a bad thing to actually burn some elephant dung, had it? Have a bit of a waft over the car and see what good or bad it does to us. Let's hope they haven't been eating a lot of tambuti by the time we do it this afternoon. But I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll bring it and I'll show you. But yes, you can burn elephant dung and it is a fantastic repellent for mosquitoes and flies. In actual fact, in some of the reserves that I've visited where you have lots of tsetse fly and tsetse fly are these flies that bite you with a white hot needle and um, the guides there have elephant burners or these the, the, of a similar design to what I'll show you this afternoon hanging on the front of their car and one hanging on the back of their car and the smoke wafts over you for a six or seven hour safari Right, so this is where we saw that elephant. Let us see. Well, here it is. Two. Yes. Hello. What I'm going to try and do is get, not try and startle her. Him, actually. Young male. Let's see if we can. I actually think that this is the same young male we were with yesterday morning. Can you believe it? Let's see. Good morning, boy. I just want to be quiet and slow and calm and precise. Have a look at that. That is three yards away from where we are right now. So Kat, all the way from Kansas, um, well, good evening to you Kat, firstly, and you've asked, do I wear insect repellent or would it bother the animals? Now Kat, if you'd excuse me whispering with this, I don't want to disturb this Ellie busy f pushing his trunk through the bush literally two feet from where we are now but yes I do wear insect repellent in summer on my legs uh, for ticks in particular um, because I walk around in the grass so much and apart f it, and it, 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 it does smell but I've never seen it bother an animal too much I think the smell of a human all our different scents together the detergents we wash our clothes with the soaps we wash with toothpaste Creams, sun creams and moisturizing creams and lip balm and whatever else we lather all over our bodies is just a mix that for most animals when you're walking around in the bush 
is a smell that they, they tend to just avoid. But yes, I do wear insect repellent. Now this is quite interesting. This elephant, I thought it was one that we had seen yesterday, but in closer inspection, this elephant only has one tusk, you can see. He's broken his other tusk off. Now for such a young lad to have broken off his tusk, my immediate thought is that he, rather than breaking it off, he may have actually only been born with one tusk. Now why I think that, I don't know, but it's most likely that he broke it off feeling. But have a look at that, using that tusk, the one that he has left, to great effect. And once again, not destroying these red thorns. In, in this particular case, this elephant has now picked a branch off the red thorn. But rather than break the entire tree, oh, here we go, we can see what happens that red thorn will be looking like this in 24 hours time. Now he's just bitten off the stick. He hasn't even eaten the leaves. He's just wanting to eat the sticks. Not much water coming out. That was actually amazing. Uh, we just watched a, a, an elephant urinate only probably about two liters, half a gallon of urine not much at all and I'm wondering if it's not because these elephants are so dehydrated at the moment it's just one of those things that sort of save moisture that's incredible so probably as little a urine puddle that I've ever witnessed from an elephant has just come out of one that's amazing so yeah obviously the elephant once again, just adapting to this dry climate, bodies are retaining as much moisture as they can. Red, you're right, this elephant does tear branches off this tree like nothing. They're incredibly strong, you know, they, they, they don't, they, they they, they're strong to a point where we actually can't really even decide how strong they actually are. You know, it's just, it's unusually strong. He's now going around to the other side of that buffalo thorn. Let's see what he does there. Wanting those fresh leaves. But D, you've actually just asked a question that I was trying to figure out in my mind as you asked it. You asked, how old do I think this elephant is? Now D, um, the only real way to decide how old an elephant is, is for the elephant to show us what set of teeth he's on. They get six sets of molars, and we'd be able to see an exact age from the wear and tear on which particular pair of molars he is. But because I can't see those molars, I'm now having to use other indicators. His size, for one, would be an indicator, so size relative to tusk length, the condition of his ears, the general condition that he has in, so sunken temples, um, a massively developed skull, um, all would lead me to believe that he is older than what he is. This particular elephant has got quite nice tusks. He's definitely not very big. I mean, he's as big as a large female elephant, and that is tiny for male elephant for male elephant stature. His skin is in good condition, his ears are in good condition. And the fact that he's with a breeding herd of elephant and not in must would make me believe that this particular male elephant is probably somewhere between 12 and 17 maybe, not as old as 17. I'd say he's probably in his mid-teens, around about 13 to 15 years old if I were to gather any sort of meaningful guesses together. Well, that is what I would guess, just using those indicators that I've just told you there. 
Skin's in very good condition, ears in very good condition, skull not overly developed, he's not particularly big, he's not in mutts and he's with a breeding herd of elephant. That's what I can see from where we are. Oh, he's just stuck his head into this buffalo thorn. Buffalo thorns out here take an absolute hammering from elephants. We found a big buffalo thorn the other day and they're just so rare to see. Because generally speaking, elephants, as you can see from this one, have broken off branches almost all the way around it and they end up being these scraggly, twiggy things. And in some areas, they've just completely almost been annihilated. And this particular elephant, he's taking care not to damage the branches at the top. He seems to be going for the choicest ones closer into the... The, the main stem or the main bushy part of this particular tree and you can see how careful he's being, he's just plucking off a branch at a time there you go and once again just adding to this impression that I, you know elephant are quite often just portrayed as these wanton destroyers of the vegetation I don't think so, I've watched them with red thorns lately and they are very particular about how they prune red thorns and you can watch this elephant with this buffalo thorn while the tree looks like it's taken a bit of a hammering from from elephant it's still growing and he is just particularly being particular about what branches to put in his mouth I mean, he's not eating the terminal ends off of the branches breaking the sticks as you see So Lauren, you've just asked me an interesting question. You've, you've said, would this male, you know, if he doesn't stay with a herd and females do, would he know his sisters from his moms? And w is there a chance that elephant mate with their relatives? Um, Lauren, there's always a chance that animals will mate with their relatives, but, but um, generally speaking, animals are a bit more resilient to to inbreeding than what, what humans would be, for instance. The reason for that is they've got a, a little bit of a deeper genetic diversity. Um, unlike humans and cheetah, for instance, and probably rhinoceros to a point, we haven't gone through an evolutionary bottleneck where the amount of breeding females that were available to any given species was reduced to a couple of dozen or a couple of hundred. Um, there are, in humans, I think about 60, it's, it's either 60 or 600 different types of, of genetic variations which have led scientists to believe that Homo sapiens went through a bit of an evolutionary bottleneck that reduced the numbers of humans down to virtually nothing. Um, elephant haven't gone through that particular bottleneck. Cheetah have, white rhino definitely have, black rhino definitely have. Um, and so you don't have much diversity with those species. But now to actually answer your question uh, as to would they know their siblings? Yes, they would know their siblings. Elephant, big male elephant, leave their herds at about 12 to 18 years old, and then they become nomadic. And Mother Nature forces this nomadic life on them while they're still young and they're not really sexually active and they're not really big enough to compete for females so that their wanderings take them far away from the natal home range of their, of their, their, you know, their, 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 their relatives, basically. So that the hope is, when this elephant is finally big enough and strong enough, um, he's far enough away from his natal range that he doesn't mate with his sisters. And that is why males do get nomadic in almost any species, not just elephant. So just to, in conclusion to this point, you can see that this male elephant at some point will leave his herd. He will spend another 12 or 15, maybe even 16, up to 20 years wandering the Kruger National Park. They don't have a territory or a home range. Hopefully by the time he's big enough and strong enough to compete with other elephant for mating rights, he will be far away from this, from this particular herd that gave birth to him. But if it did have to happen, for whatever reason, it's not that much of a problem once or twice or for one or 
I hope that answered your question adequately there. Um, and on that point, I think it's about time that we sent you back through to Brent, who's got an update for you. We are on the western edge of our traverse area at the moment and uh, we are searching for any sign of leopard. So far, no luck. I've also got my Arethusa radio on, so just keeping a, an ear out to what's happening in the west. Now, Herbie's been out and he did tell me that there were tracks of a female leopard, unfortunately leaving Juma and going into Sibambili which is, of course, outside of our traverse area. So I think we might take a swing past Red Dam, see what's happening there this beautiful winter's morning. Hi Chloe in Illinois. Chloe is wondering, do we ever see any caracal in the area? Uh, Chloe, I've heard of only one caracal being seen in the last couple of months uh, on a property just to the south of us, but there's always a possibility. And with this drought and lack of vegetation, it's our best chance to possibly see one in the next couple of months. Always going very carefully along this road. It's a very busy road, so you got to go quite slowly to see tracks nicely. And also, it's quite nice to just to go slowly and bask in the sunlight, like a lot of other creatures are going to be doing at the moment. No sign of anything yet. So what our plan is, is we're going to head down, we're going to nip into Arethusa, check down towards the Murakene River, and then pop back up towards Red Dam. Hi D. Dee's wondering, is it quite cold there? Well, Dee, that all depends on where you're from in the world. For us, it, it's quite nippy at the moment. It's winter. Uh, our temperatures are ranging from um, about 40-odd Fahrenheit. Oh, hello. Um, to, uh, to around 60 in the mornings, but heating up to up to about 95. Yeah, hello elephant. So you guys, I'm just listening to the radio. I copied, thanks Mike. Hello. Okay guys, we've I've just got a report in, in my ear that is um, going to have to make me drive very fast, very far. I need to get down to Cheetah Plains, and I'm not going to tell you why. Uh, copy, Mike. I'm on route. Okay, I've got to go across to Steph, um, but hopefully we'll be there as soon as possible. Just as I said, the artwork that is going to be rusty when it returns back from this, uh, from this safari is going to be something to witness. 
we're just calmly looking at these elephants which are not going anywhere right now. <laughs> That's a, I don't quite know what the dynamic is between these two elephants. I think they're relatives. I don't think it's mother and calf. I think they're cousins or sisters, potentially, because it's not a very old female, the big one. And the youngster and her have decided that that tree needs to be cut very short. Obviously, totally opposite to what I was talking about, elephants knowing that they, what they are doing and how they prune different things. And they are literally just putting a twig in their mouth at a time and just stripping that tree of everything. Not killing it, they're not, they're not breaking it at the root. All they're doing is they're chewing off every single branch that they can fit into their mouth without killing the tree. So the tree will survive that mauling um, by coppicing. And what that means is it'll, it'll become sort of multi-branched. That main stem will split into many smaller stems. Have a look at that female, not using her trunk. Doesn't want to kill the tree, just biting off the branch. So actually, let me, let me change my original statement by saying that they are still pruning this particular tree only rather aggressively. Rather, rather than killing it. Now in winter, or the dry season when there's not a lot of grass around, elephants become almost completely browsers. In other words, they will change their diet from almost completely grass in summer to almost completely woody species of, of trees. Um, and they will absolutely just eat as much as they can, filling up, I mean a big male elephant, you're looking at 200 kilograms, 400 pounds of, of bush in a day per elephant. Now even if you halve that and halve that again, 50 pounds, um, so even if, you've, even if you halve that and then halve that again at 50 pounds, you're still looking at around 20,000 elephant at 50 pounds of food an average a day. You can work out that maths and you'll see that it is a lot of food that is getting consumed in terms of bushy species. Now, Chloe, um, you've asked me what is an elephant's favorite food. Chloe, that is so difficult to say. I would say that... In summertime, it's definitely grass and the, the more high protein grasses, panicums and the guinea grasses, I think, maybe uh, the thermidas, um, because you see them sitting in these fields, literally stuffing their mouth full after mouthful after mouthful of grass, and they spend hours, even days in these areas. Um, outside of the grasses would have to be a difference. They, they seem to enjoy acacia bark. Um, they seem to be enjoy mopani leaves because you see them eating a lot of those particular types. The bark from, I suppose, um, it's a mixture of everything really. Different trees are providing different things for elephants and I think that they have they will develop a, 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 a taste for sugarcane and for crops. And that's probably where, I, where I'm leading to with this particular conversation, is that they are crop raiding. In other words, they'll develop a taste for sugarcane or maize or millet or some other type of farmed crop. And they'll become absolute pests. A lot of people in Africa are killed every year by elephants. And equally, a lot of elephants in Africa are killed every year because of their crop raiding um, attitudes that they get. They develop this bad habit. And an elephant that has an, an developed a taste for citrus or for sugarcane or for maize um, quite often needs to be destroyed. And I say that in the lighter sense. I mean, people have been destroying crop raiding elephants for centuries. Um, and it's not such a problem nowadays. Nowadays, the boundary between South Africa at least anyway the boundary between people and, and animals is incredibly well patrolled it's it's well it's well secure in other parts of Africa uh, people have been moved away from these wilderness areas or 
potentially the wilderness areas have been proclaimed far away from people. Who knows which one came first? And I think there's probably a good mix of both. But um, you have these areas where people inhabit but don't live. So people collect wood and maybe hunt a little bit, collect bush medicine, will harvest a variety of different types of, of fruits and roots and leaves for food. Uh, elephant will also cross out of the reserves where they're not persecuted into these what we call game management areas, these buffer zones between where people stay and where animals live. Um, and they can be quite extensive. I mean, I know in Zambia they can be even up to 100 kilometers wide in some areas. And that's an extensive piece of land, this gray zone. And that is in areas where it's too expensive or too difficult to maintain a perimeter around a particular wilderness area. They don't have fences. In actual fact, I think South Africa is the only, f in, is the only country in Africa that has fenced almost all of its national parks. So people can literally live right up onto the boundary. And problem animals are therefore eradicated. Um, or the problem of a problem animal is reduced. Let me put it to that way. Reduced to almost zero. I had this wonderful encounter with a man called Nakedi a couple of years back. And he was doing a doctorate degree on leopard. And in particular leopard and cheetah, in terms of large predators, uh, find boundaries very porous. They don't, they're not hemmed in by fences. They don't, they don't. They're not restricted by fences at all. Even electrified fences, cheetah and, and wild dog and, and leopard, but in particular uh, cheetah and leopard, I don't even see these things. And he was studying the effect of how many times do leopards on the periphery of these reserves go into, into urban areas or into rural areas and what are they eating? Uh, he was doing scat samples to figure out if they were eating dogs and chickens and cats um, and it was just amazing he, the amount of information that he was gathering on these leopard that we saw in reserves like the Sabi Sands that are relatively close to human settlements relative being the word um, and the amount of time that these animals spent in settlements was just astounding it, it you know the fact that more people are not killed by these animals just shows the Massive tolerance that these animals actually have for humans. And therein lies another topic of conversation. You know, humans seeing themselves as something apart from the natural environment, which they're not. Our, our beard, um, well hello for one, uh, and and yeah, it's good to hear from you. And secondly, um, you've asked me what type of fence keeps elephants in or out of areas. Um, it's quite a substantial fence made up of cable, really, and railway sleepers. And it's also electrified. Elephants are quite sensitive to electrified fences. Um, and so it's electrified. It's quite often doesn't have, it doesn't need a razor wire wire on the top. Um, that is generally just for people. Elephant seem to react nicely just to a thick fence that they can see that's been electrified really and that's the type of fence i'll see if i can there's no way on juma we're far away from fences at juma but except for at the gauri gate manuleti junction at some point i will go past there and i'll make a point of stopping and showing you an elephant fence now these elephants have managed to absolutely annihilate this poor tree shame but still without breaking it I mean, you often see elephants pushing down massive trees, but this time of the year, I'm not hearing cracks and crackles. I think they've done the big pruning that they've needed to, and now they're just aggressively pruning this poor tree that made them cross with it. Uh, Morning Glory, you've, you've commented on something that's close to my heart. You've said, you know, you, it always amazes you how 
you how how elephants decide when to knock a tree down or when to just strip it and I, you know it's something that i've been talking about for the last two or three days or so i agree with you 100 percent. i don't think that they're the wanton destroyers of the bush i think that elephant know exactly what they're doing and while it may seem a little bit aggressive and it probably is this is africa where extremes are the norm um I actually do think that they know exactly what they're doing. You know, I think that this, there she goes and takes off the last branch. You can see now she could quite easily just pull that entire tree out of the ground and then using her feet there, she doesn't want that other one. It's definitely a female and a young male. It could even be a calf. She just saw him off there. She wants to finish that tree on her own. <laughs> yeah, she puts the whole stick in her mouth. Have a look at that entire stick she's now putting in her mouth that's a forked stick she's got the one side of the fork in her mouth now let's see what she does does she choose to break the tree down and then use her foot to break that last stick or does she walk away let's see what she does no she's putting the stick in her mouth again trying to chew it off what are you doing girl you can see how much of that stick she actually had in her mouth and look how feathered the top is from them chewing it. Let's see, yeah, she uses her tusk again and she's chewing another stick off right at the top. <laughs> this is the most bizarre behavior. I've literally just seen this in the last two days or so. There she's now pulling it. She's now, those end sticks she's chewed completely feathered at the top. I wonder if the tree itself is not leaking out somewhere at the top of sap. There she's now bending the last branch there. Look at her using her tusk, stripping it. I mean, and it's not like that elephant couldn't just snap that tree straight out of the ground. She could absolutely with the least amount of ease. Let's see what she does here. There she breaks the branch again. First one way, then the other. And there she's busy stripping it, using that tusk and her trunk to great effect on that particular branch. Ah. So Bush Mom has just um, sent us through some information which I'd like to share with everybody. Bush Mom says that in some, well firstly you asked the question about are, are elephants scared of bees? And secondly the information that you sent through is that in some areas beehives are being erected, uh, attached to a wire and when elephant touch the wire and shake the beehive the bees come out and the elephants run away and this is a natural way of of saving crops for one but also saving the honeybee and also pollinating uh, food plants and you know I suppose it's a whole massive thing it's obviously working uh, bush mom otherwise they wouldn't be doing it and I just think that that's fantastic it's just another awesome initiative from people rather than resorting to guns and violence just a way of working together with nature have I seen elephants scared with bees um, the drones that we had flying around here a couple of months ago sounded like a swarm of bees and we definitely saw that at a distance of a couple of meters above an elephant's head that they reacted to the sound of that drone and I know from walking around with that drone following me in the bush it sounded exactly like a swarm of bees was flying overhead. Um, would bees be able to kill an elephant? Um, no, I don't think that bees would be able to kill an elephant. I mean, they'd sting it on its face and its ears, and their ears are relatively sensitive. I mean, I don't think anything wants to be stung by a bee, barring a honey badger, perhaps. Even he wouldn't want to be stung by a bee. They just don't care. Um, so, oof, that's a good question. Scared of bees, the noise, I think, and the suddenness of bees arriving, the, the expected violence of an attack, the swarming around their face and in their ears, um, Potentially bees crawling in their ears and stinging the sensitive parts of the ears, the tip of the trunk on their eyes. Yes, 
I think that elephants would be scared of bees and obviously it would be, it's an interesting thing, this initiative of the symbiosis between people, bees and elephants. Um, I think that that's quite an interesting story. So yeah, thank you very much for sharing that with us, Bushmom. Feel free to email that article uh, or whatever email, or whatever information you can. Send it through to questions at wildearth.tv. I know Lou will try and print it out or send it to me via email. I'd love to read the whole article if you can. Just makes for some nice information to share with people all over the reserve. And these ellies have moved, which means that we can't see them anymore. So if you'd bear with me while I move the car a little bit. Okay, I want to see if we can just go around the corner a little bit and see if we can get to these elephants. This road makes quite an interesting jink in front of us and actually goes in that direction and see if we can get a little bit closer. There still only seem to be three uh, there still only seem to be three uh, elephant here. I don't see anything more. Four elephant. Okay, so we've got another one here. Maybe it's the same one. <laughs> the road twisting. I don't actually know. So yeah, Louise has just made a comment that this may be the short trunk herd. I know that she is in quite a small herd. And... That's absolutely a viable comment there, Louise. Let's see if we can see one of the, well, the big female without the trunk, I think is the key. There is one elephant. Let's see, she seems to be the biggest. So I think this is that young male that, with a single tusk. Let me just see. But that young, that, that lady without the, at the tip to her trunk, she's got a tiny calf with her and I can't see a baby here. Although there are actually more than one. Ah, and also all the members of her herd have tusks, whereas this is young bull is diagnostic of this particular herd with his single tusk. So Anna Marie, you've asked me a question, um, or asked us a question, let me say. You've asked us a question about elephant tusks. And does the quality of the vegetation determine elephant tusk length or, or I suppose, size? Or is it purely genetic? Um, is it, it's an interesting answer, that one, um, actually. In that, yes, elephant, the, the, the vegetation will definitely have an impact on their tusks. In, in this aspect, the harder and the coarser the wood that they have to eat during the dry season will wear their tusks down faster. And in areas where you just have hardwood trees or a majority of hardwood trees, quite often elephant tusks are broken off. Botswana is a prime example, a lot of Maru, uh, Mupani there, and these elephants in, in Botswana quite often have fractured tusks. But there's also a genetic aspect uh, to to it. Um, elephants in the Kruger National Park have very long, very big tusks. In Botswana you'll find very thick, stubby tusked elephant um, that will have massively wide tusks and that is absolutely genetic. So you do have a genetic aspect, you do have a type of vegetation aspect and then the third thing that creeps in is the actual minerals availability in that area. Some areas have enough minerals to keep animals 100% healthy. Other areas are mineral deficient and in areas like forests and things elephant actually have to eat clay and have to eat a bunch of you know you sometimes see elephant eating bits and pieces of the ground it's called geophagy and that's to get these minerals that they they can't find in their diet uh, you know, uh, into their systems. And that can have a, a, an effect on the fragility of, of tusks and make them a bit more fragile, a little bit more brittle. So nice question there. You know, I hope I answered it. I feel like I'm not giving anyone any, ans any real answers today. It's just discussions. <laughs> 
This elephant is standing now in a thicket. It looks like he's standing in a sickle bush thicket actually. Let me have a double check there and see what it is. No, it's another red thorn thicket. He's just once again just picked a branch off, one of the smaller branches at the top. Ah, now Brent has managed in record time to make it to Cheetah Plains and has a surprise for you. I'm jealous. So there we go. Uh, when I got the report, this buffalo was still alive and the Styx lionesses have managed to catch a buffalo. And uh, it's just, just expired. And the cubs are really getting stuck in. The ladies are still a bit tired to start feeding just yet. But these little cubs are being incredible incredibly aggressive with each other. I can hear that growling. Getting stuck in. Now you can see you know buffalo inside and out. Oh, here we go. Listen to those little growls. have been doing quite well recently from what I've heard. They made quite a few kills. This is right on the border of Nkoro and Cheetah Plains. Look at the little one just sitting on top. Okay. Can you believe those growls are coming from babies? Absolutely drenched in blood already. Look at the other one's gonna go drink the blood that's pooling. But here comes another Birmingham. Now let's see what he's gonna do when he gets to that carcass. He should be quite tolerant to the cubs. There's a lioness coming in. Might not be so tolerant of her. See how she immediately backs off. one drenched little cub. Oh, look at that nose to nose with the big Birmingham. trouble from dad ah. 
Now, Blue Butter Frog says these cubbies are definitely going to need some cleaning later. <laughs> Oh, it's definitely been a lion morning. Oh, moving away. Just keeping quiet so we can hear what's going on. The male will be tolerant of the cubs to a degree, but he might chase off the females. Linda would like to know, are these the mangy looking cubs that were left alone at the Juma pan or that muddy empty pan the other day? They are indeed. This is the Styx Pride. So there are eight cubs here, three adult lionesses. And then, uh, wow. Sorry about that. And just one adult male at the moment, but he is part of the Birmingham Coalition. The, there's another one who's with the Torchwood Pride around the Kruger boundary and Torchwood, and then the two with the Inkahuma Pride. Now, Safari Dean says that's the cutest thing covered in blood I've ever seen. Yes, they are quite sweet looking. It's amazing how much they sound like adults when they growl. Sorry, I'm just going to move my mic. Sorry if it makes a terrible noise. There we go. Look at that. <laughs> I, I can't. I can't decide. I think I really like the the cub that looks like it's been. James Richard is wondering, well, don't the cubs only have their milk teeth? So do they have to wait for an adult to open up? Oh, yes. um, they probably, you've probably found even with their milk teeth, they will be able to chew through certain parts of the skin, the soft area around the nether regions. But it's much easier when it has been opened by the adults, of course. So unfortunately guys, there are quite a lot of people waiting to get here. We'll stay for as long as possible and then we will make space for the other vehicles. I just wanted to get here 
as quickly as possible because there's always this incredible interaction um, just after uh, the animal is killed and when the animals are still quite hungry and just getting involved in the feeding process. And look at those little guys. Vim, just off to the left. Look at that one licking the blood off its. Uh, I stopped off mom's face. That was the lioness that looked like she was around the nostrils. And now the cub is just licking the blood all off her lips. Lulu Fire is wondering, how did I find out that the sticks were on a kill? I got a call on the radio from Mike <coughs> on Cheetah Plains. Sound. Those are cubs growling. Now, Justin is wondering how many lion kills could lions accumulate over their life? Oof, Justin, I, I'm afraid that's a near impossible uh, thing to answer because it all depends. Now, the more cubs that try feed in the same spot, the more aggressive it'll become. The males get dragging it now. Now, Emma's wondering would the lions eat the stomach content? They would not, Emma. The stomach content of a buffalo is undigested grass, and of course, lions are after the meat. Now, the bones, if they are able to break open the bones, they definitely will eat them, as the marrow is a very, very good source of protein. See, the, the cubs seem to be playing who's the king of the buffalo on top. Incredible to watch. There's the big battle between the, the two smallest 
Cubs trying to get right inside that buffalo. Oh, watch out for dad. But it's happy days for the sticks pride now. Lots of meat. Hopefully a good meal will start getting these cubs looking a little bit better. Now, Morning Glory is wondering, oh, the whole sticks pride here, yes. Well, here we go. We've got one lioness, two lioness, three lioness, and uh, one, two. The cubs keep moving, that's what makes them difficult. Three, four, five, six, and I think the others are just behind that buffalo's body that we can't see. Look at that one sneaking up to try feed where the male's opened. Let's see how that works out for him. Mm, cheeky. <laughs> oh, he's going to keep trying. Got to like his attitude. Oh, you've really got to admire the courage of that little one. I'll take a swat back at you, Dad. Look at him, he's still snarling. Still snarling. He's sneaking in again. Oh, it's going to get back up. Oh, oh. So Anne in Durban says surely nutrition is the best defense against the skin disorder and yes it is. Bye bye. Good to I Look at this. It's 
hopefully that little cub is going to try and get to that area. So the male's actually open up. It's probably going to go, he's going to get the tongue. There we go. <laughs> it's got the tongue. And there it goes. This little guy is still making an incredible racket while trying to sneak closer to where the male is feeding. Oh, look at that little cub just to the right there. He keeps popping his head up. Oh, here we go, the next one calling in. Let's see what happens. I'm not actually coming in here, I'm not actually coming in here. There's the brave and very loud little one coming back. Look at that incredible power, how that male moves that carcass. Look, Joanne says, look at that. Cubs are practicing. The ones on top of the buffalo for when they have to catch their own buffalo. Now there's three going in there. Let's see how long it takes before Dad sends a swat. You can see how tolerant the males are of the cubs. Now if that had to be a lioness, there's no, he would have probably whacked her around the ears already. Yes, little ones. Mm. Now, Anna Marie is wondering if I think this Birmingham boy took part in the kill. Anna Marie, I know for a fact he did not. So I heard over the radio that he just watched the ladies take it down. Okay, let's see what happens now with those two little rascals getting right there where he's feeding.
authority and says, look, let's jump on top of the carcass and let dad pull you around. <laughs> the one thing we can definitely say is the sticks cubs are not lacking in character. moved off the lionesses and try to come in and feed. position quickly there. Are there any stations standing by for the Zangara? Sherry in Colorado. Sherry is wondering why lions don't hoist their kills like leopards. Well, Sherry, buffalo weighs a fair amount, and also lions are not the best tree climbers. When leopards are specially adapted uh, to being able to climb trees, uh, lions not so much. And lions live in social groups, so it's more animals to protect their they kill from potential other predators or thieves where there's leopards or solitary so it helps to have a ladder. It's definitely warming up. Just incredible. Oh, look at that on top. Ready for a little war. Oh, well, it looks like it's all settled a little bit, so let's jump back on board with Steph, who's got a feathered friend. Welcome back. Wow, I bet Brent in his element, having raced across there, get to see 
The, all those cubs fighting over that carcass. I mean, just amazing. Really, really, really awesome. What you're looking at here, hopefully you can see, it's not the best view, but there in silhouette in the middle of the tree, just below the main stem, is a batelier. And these bateliers are just waiting for the thermals. It'll almost, we're almost ready for thermals at this time of the day. And there we go. Well, so, as I said, almost ready for thermals. Here we go, batelier getting ready to fly out. Just going to see if we can, there we go, Dave's on him. Her, on him. And there we got awesome. It's looking like it might go and sit in that bush. There we go. How awesome was that? Just swap trees. Uh, Chloe, all the way from Illinois, you've just asked me what's my favorite bird species. Oh, I'd, I'd probably have to say. Wow. My favorite call is definitely the crested Franklin. Um, as to my favorite bird species, hmm, probably the more animated of the birds. So any of the animated birds, birds that don't just sit and do nothing all day or sit and wade. So I suppose the sunbirds, sunbirds and kingfishers I really, I really enjoy. They're just always busy. And I suppose a group of birds that hold my interest, in other words, I'd like to travel to go to a place to go and see these types of birds. It would have to be the sunbirds or the hummingbirds. I just really enjoy their colors and the fact that they're just so super energetic. Now what's happened with this particular batelier? Now bateliers are carrion feeders, so tying it into that carcass that, you, that you've just been hauled away from is that these birds, these bateliers, will often get flying first before the vultures because they're slightly lighter than the vultures, so they can do with less of a thermal. They will then fly around and very often see carcasses first, land in trees nearby, and it's on, on, the, on the back of these birds finding kills first that often vultures will come and investigate a particular area. Now, I'm just double checking my fact here because I'm a bit rusty on on sexing of a battalier, but that wing panel that you can see there, so just behind just below the white bar on the wing is a black line. And now it's either a male or a female. So just give me one second here. I think the larger in eagles is always the female. And the smaller of the two is always the male and the, the reason for that is that females have to produce an egg and they do it using obviously the materials in their in their in their bodies and they need to be slightly bigger because birds are incredibly weight sensitive so by her taking out some of her body to make an egg she needs to be able to replace that energy and she needs to be able to fly around with that egg inside of her for a bit so in eagles, at least, the, bird, the, the females are always bigger. Now, I'm just busy checking here. I'll be with you in one second and see to sex this particular one. It is a male, I thought so. All right, so it's a male, and I know that because of the totally black wing bar just below that white patch. Females you'll be able to see a white portion there. It'll be completely white. So when they're flying above you, half, half, half white, half black is male, and then a skinny little line is a female. This is a male battalier, even though he looks quite impressive. He's fairly big. Also called the short-tailed snake eagle. It was called the short-tailed snake eagle for a while. They've got a, they've got a unique way of catching snakes. They sometimes swoop down onto a snake that's crossing a road, pick it up, and then whiplash it in the sky. In other words, they'll pick it up, drag it into the sky, drop it, catch it mid-air, change direction very quickly, which whips that snake, and obviously breaks its spine and kills it, and then they eat the snake. So they are called snake eagles, and if this particular battalier allows us a glimpse, you'll see that its feet well, not its feet really, but its, its, its legs are not covered in feathers. They have got featherless legs. 
and they'll use their wings and their feet to strike out at snakes as well. Obviously, if a snake strikes the feathers on the wings, it's harmless. And then the unfeathered legs are more maneuverable, and they'll strike out using their sharp claws and talons and incredibly strong grip to then disable the snake. But that being said, these short-tailed snake eagles are mostly carrion feeding. They're mostly scavenging birds. And will very often just wait for easier pickings off of a carcass, similar to that one that you are lucky enough to be viewing with Brent. Quintessentially African way of looking at things is this snake eagle in their trees. Because they are carrion feeding birds, you don't really find these birds outside of national parks in South Africa. Um, and that's because they get poisoned quite often. Well, I don't know if it still happens as much, but quite often carcasses, poisoned carcasses are left out to kill in particular jackal and caracal. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. I try to cover that as best as I could. <laughs> Oh, excuse me, please. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, and quite often they fall victim to these poisoned carcasses. And so pairs of bataliers that live on the periphery of national parks in South Africa quite often fall victim, their babies especially, fall victim to these poisoned carcasses. Talking about babies... One of this eagle's babies is flying around us. And I'm going to see if we can pick it up. It's flying over this valley here, over my head. And while I need to get my pink head out of your shot there, so I can stop disgusting you. The, um, let's see if we can see that. Now, it's probably landed now. It was busy calling, calling now. And I can't actually see which tree it landed in. Let's go around the corner and see if we can see it a bit easier. Now I know that it's immature because it was colorless. It had brown feathers, not black and white feathers. Ah, so James Richard, you just commented on uh, enjoying the double-banded sand grass that we showed you eventually after waiting at that pan for so long last night. And you want to know how many other types of sand grass we find in this area. Uh, James, while there may be some overlap in the northern part of the Kruger with one or two of the other sand grass species, here in particular we only get the double-banded sand grass. And that one that we saw last night was the female. And I know that because she was uniformly colored. The males have this big, bold black and white stripe across their chest. Just have a look at this magnificent knob thorn. I'm going to go back a little bit to just give you the impression here. I like these trees. When I first started guiding, this was the first tree that I could identify from its flowers and my trainer at that stage just said, they're easy, they're the ice cream trees. And have a look at that. You can see I mean, it's going to take a little bit of imagination with this particular tree, but you can imagine a cone with an ice cream blob on the top there. Isn't that just amazing? Let's go a little bit closer and have a look at its flowers, and maybe we'll be lucky enough to see what's pollinating it. There's not that many bees around, to be quite honest, and not that many flies. There was one fly, I think James had a fly on a, on a knobthorn flower the other day. So you might find that being the first flowers in the season, there's a butterfly. And you see the butterfly there, Dave? Up on the top, a little bit up to the left. There you go. Up at the top left corner, there's a butterfly there on the edge. There we go. Let's see if we can identify that particular butterfly for you. I have my butterfly book and I've been looking forward to using it. And that'll give us an idea. Let's see if we can identify that butterfly for you. Hey, fly away. 
We've still got him. I can't even see him anymore. Well done, Dave. I see quite a few insects actually swimming around here. Okay, so I've got the one. So here we go. You can come through here. I've figured it out. So the butterflies that are flying around here are busy pollinating this particular knobthorn acacia are the acrias. And there was this acria and the one that we were looking at was this one. So the window acria and the broad bordered acria was the two of the butterflies that we saw busy pollinating this particular flower. The acria. You might find, let's see if we can see anything else. I don't see any bees, I just see those two butterflies. Let me have a so we've got the acria again, right at the top there. Oh yes. Oh, <laughs> oh Beard, you've just commented on how did I see that butterfly from so far away. I didn't actually, to be quite honest with you, I expected that there was going to be a butterfly on here. Or I'm ex I, not a butterfly, a, um, a pollinator of some sort, and it just caught my eye. That's an acria, except that there was now another butterfly there. There was also an African monarch on the leaf as well. Or it may have been a dancing acria. Just judging from the fact that the other two butterflies we saw were both acrias, I'm going to go with a dancing acria that looks like the acrias are the ones that are pollinating these flowers. I also see a jewel beetle. So I've got a blue jewel beetle. Let's see what else we can see here. I'm going to see if I can show you that blue jewel beetle. It might be a little bit too much for this camera that we got. So, Dave, there where that butterfly's flying there now, yes. there where it's landed, just above it, the topmost flower has got a dark spot in the middle of it. That's a jewel beetle. So let me see. Go. There we go. We're going in, in, in. There you go. You can see that. There where that butterfly just threw. There we go. That dark spot is a jewel beetle, a blue jewel beetle. And that jewel beetle will be probably sucking the sap from the tree or feeding on the pollen. So we've got jewel beetles, some acrias. I don't see anything else. So butterflies and beetles so far. It's going to be interesting to see what else comes onto these flowers but anyway thank you for sharing these flowers with us you fantastic tree and on that note i think it would be good to send you all the way back through to those lions with brent who's got an update on what they've been doing so we have left the lions we're going to go back there before the end of drive i'm just going to go take a quick check around um, the southern open areas see if there's a possibility of a cheetah or uh, ostriches and uh, or maybe I'm hoping to catch up with Gnormless Gnormin the Gnu my old mate. Oof. Have a look. This is also the area in Kanyen has been spending a lot of time in. <coughs> now, good morning to Siberia, one of our zoomies. Siberia saying have I ever heard any folklores or stories of uh, indigenous people using cheetah, lion or leopard for hunting. There is only one that I know of and it's not you, oh, I suppose it is, but it's, it's more of a moral, it's a, a moral folklore, a moral story. 
um, about the, the lazy hunter. And it's a Zulu story, um, the lazy hunter. It was a particularly lazy man. And uh, when he happened upon a female cheetah who had five cubs and she was hunting, and he saw how good she was at hunting. And uh, she left the cubs lying in a thicket like most of the big cats do and went off to have a drink of water. And the lazy hunter thought to himself, mm, if I catch one of those, I can use it to hunt. So then he got there, he took one cub, then he thought, but if I have two cubs, then I don't have to do any hunting. So he took a second, he thought, but hey, if I have three, four, five, if I have five cubs, then I'm sorted for life. So he took all five cubs and disappeared. The female cheetah came back and she started calling and crying and she cried so much that it darkened and stained her face. And that's why cheetah have those black tear marks going down their eyes. Um, eventually one of the village elders said, Mother Cheetah, what is the problem? She says, I don't know. Someone has stolen my cubs. And eventually that lazy hunter got caught. And the village elders returned the baby, <coughs> sorry, um, Cheetah to mom. And uh, the lazy hunter was expelled to wander the wilderness on his own. That's the only story I've heard of. Uh, generally, in most African cultures, the only domesticated animals, uh, apart from livestock, have been dogs, and dogs are used for hunting throughout Africa. Now, more than likely, dogs domesticate themselves over time, uh, scavenging around people, and people probably didn't chase them away because they developed into an early warning system for bigger predators like lions and stuff being around. The dogs would yap, bark, and notify the people. And that's probably how the domestication of dogs happened. <coughs> uh, hi, Virginia. Virginia is in Kentucky. And Virginia would like to know what is the most intelligent animal in the bush and the least intelligent animal? Uh, well, Virginia, that's a difficult question because I suppose a lot of actually what we would consider intellect is actually instinct, but I'd say probably in terms of the capacity of learning, the most intelligent animals in the bush are probably baboons and vervet monkeys and uh, with hyenas very close in that. In that, those three probably the most intelligent. Um, the most stupid? Hmm. Probably, probably, what do you think is the most stupid, Fem? Crocodile. Well, no, a crocodile is actually one of the nice. It's one of the only reptiles that has the capacity for learning. Um, and I'd definitely say a crocodile is smarter than quite a few other things out there. Um, so snails. snails, yes, snails are probably quite stupid. Um, but I think uh, Virginia is referring to mammals. I'd probably say... I'd probably say rhinos. Rhinos are not very clever and uh, neither are hippopotamus for that matter, or wildebeest. Now, uh, final control thinks squirrels, but I have uh, evidence to dispute the fact that squirrels are stupid because they still manage to get into my stash of snacks. Uh, I've now boarded up the house and they found a gap through the chimney. So I need to find a way to block up the chimney now. Yeah, well, just hoping for a view of some cheetah down here, but all I can see is some zebras. Let's just go a bit further forward.
probably making their way slowly towards the Cheetah Plains pan. Really, really still out here in the open area. Let's leave the zebras and hopefully before the end of show we'll have a chance to go back into those lines. And while we keep searching cheetah plans and slowly make our way back towards the sticks pride, uh, let's go see what Steph's up to. Welcome back, welcome back. We've come to Mumba Road and it was round about here that that young or that juvenile batelier was flying around. I'm hoping that we get to see, that we get to see some of it. Just looking at all the little bumps and protrusions in any of the trees that we got around. And then I'm also heading down towards the Mulwati because I did say that I'd like to travel in the Mulwati a little bit today so that we can see if any of the weeping boar beans are flowering in that area. In particular, I'm wanting to go there because similar to that knob thorn that you were just with, they're starting to flower. I'm hoping that they're starting to flower. And because of the massive nectar load that the weeping boar bean flower produces, it is a hive of activity. They literally, you don't even understand, the bush just moves around them with things. Ah, so Raisa, you've just said that weeping boar beans are your favorite. And I must say, this time of year, weeping boar beans are some of my favorite as well. So I'm glad that we share that in common. And I also hope that we see one today. So we're going to head down now. This road will terminate in the Mawati. And then we'll pick a direction either upstream or downstream to drive in. I'll see how I feel when I get there. And hopefully with the, the more nutrients at the river and more water that would be where I would imagine we'd get a boar bean flowering for the first time. That's on top of some or other termite mount. Um, we had a look at some of them yesterday, maybe one or two that were on top of termite mounds yesterday and I must be honest, none of them looked like they were even budding yet. But maybe we're lucky. It is going to be something that I spend the next couple of days trying to find before friend James gets back. This place always amazes me. No one really likes driving Mumba Road because it goes over this crest where we have these monkey thorns, or monkey oranges, excuse me, not monkey thorn, where we have this vast thicket of monkey orange. And it, if you do find anything here, you can never ever get into it because these trees literally rip our cars to pieces. But a lot of activity comes through them. Lots of buffalo enjoy hiding out in them. You find elephant wandering through them, lots of zebra. Steenbuck, Daker, Leopard because of that. I've walked through this particular thicket on a number of occasions and it's quite extensive. I'd say a good couple of hectares in extent across the top of this creek. One of the largest of the monkey orange thickets that we have on the property is this particular one. And you know up until I started at Juma I didn't really really ever think about the monkey orange thickets. I mean I'd seen monkey oranges of course but I didn't until I'd started here last year in April realize the extent that these monkey oranges have have invaded. I can't really call it an invasive plant. It's not an invasive plant. What it is it's growing in response to something that's happening uh, on it and it's, it's either overgrazing or it's compaction that does this. This particular plant does well in an area where other plants do not. So I, if that makes sense. So monkey oranges do well and propagate well and live well in areas that other plants don't. And generally when you've got a, when you've got a reduction in climax communities of plants, it is because of either compaction, lots of animal traffic, or um, overgrazing. Also once again, just 
lots of animals just overgrazing all the nice plants. Well, I've got some issues going on with my sound here. Let me just check in my pocket. All right, it was probably because I was leaning against it a little bit too much there and it couldn't speak nicely to the receiver. We should be sorted out now. I've now gone back into my usual position. <laughs> standard game drive position all right so now we are approaching the Mawati and I'm busy scanning the flowers of the weeping boar bean are a blood red color and so what I'm looking for is any bush with a sort of reddish tinge Jason, hi Jason. Um, you've asked, do I know anyone that's been poisoned by Tambuti smoke and what are the symptoms? I don't actually, Tambuti poisoning is one of those, Tambuti smoke poisoning is one of those things that you hear about often, but it always seems to happen to other people. Um, and so I don't know of anyone that has been poisoned by Tambuti smoke. I mean, it's obviously real, but I don't know of anyone that's been poisoned by it. And, um, are we going to go this way, Dave? Yeah, well, let's go this way. And um, the symptoms are tummy cramps and nausea, um, with an extreme case of uh, runny tummies and diarrhea being what happens. I think I may have chosen a difficult egress point here. Let's just see. No, nothing that Wendy won't be able to deal with in the blink of an eye. Alright, so now the key is just to let Wendy idle through the sand. I mean, to the point where I could get onto the door and have a chat to you like this. Oops, wait, except if my thigh stops the steering wheel from going where it needs to go. <laughs> It gives me a chance now to scan the bush over here for this weeping boar bean that we're looking at. So it'll generally just make you sick there, Jason, the Tambuti smoke poisoning, tummy cramps, nausea, and diarrhea in extreme cases. Um, I suppose if you were young, you put a baby in the smoke or you put someone who has some or other type of respiratory from the smoke. All right, we may have a little bit of signal breakup. We're in a depression here, and quite often our signal can't get out of these low places and get to our signal. So excuse us if we break up, but we'll quickly drive out of those areas. And let's see if Wendy can make this corner without the gentle prod of the accelerator pedal. All right, and while we just get out of this low signal area, and hopefully we don't find a boar bean in here, uh, we're going to send you over to Brent, who doesn't have any of those problems whatsoever. Well, welcome back. We are on our way back towards the Styx Pride. So we're heading up towards the northern boundary between Cheetah Plains and and uh, in coral and uh, that's exactly where the kill is but a little bit closer to three in a row pad Katja is wondering why the sticks in Nkuma seem to specialize in buffalo and not kudu or zebra. Uh, well, Katja, there's a lot of buffalo here, and specifically with this drought, uh, there is... Oh, sorry, Katja. Uh, there is uh, a lot of buffalo bulls, and especially with this drought, 
that are not in great condition. So that is a high reward uh, for the risk that they take on catching those buffalo. And now, especially with cubs, they're going to need to kill more often if they focus on smaller creatures uh, like kudu and zebra. Now with the buffalo, it's a good solid source of meal for a couple of days. And as those cubs get older, they're going to be, have to produce more and more meat uh, for them. And that also, oh sorry, and that also means, and also as the cubs get older, they're going to be able to also join in the buffalo hunt. Just gotta make sure that there's space back with the sticks. So we're gonna jump back on with Steph who's in the Mawati. Hopefully he can succeed where I failed and find you a white-throated robin. Oh, really? Oopsie, sorry. I've got my microphone unplugged and I didn't know I was live. <laughs> so, Davey, giving me the heads up there. <laughs> Alright, here we have a weeping boobin. Let us see if we can spot any flowers. So this is a magnificent example of a boobin. And let's see if we can get anything here. So what we're looking for is these like grape-like trusses of flowers. And similar to every other boar bean that I've actually seen for the last week or so since the knob thorns have started flying, not even a bud. I wonder if it's not in response to the dry. They need a certain amount of... That they don't have a that they don't have a certain amount of water that they need to have access to before they shoot out their buds um, because of the fact that they, they produce such a lot of nectar the nectar literally runs down the sides of these trees it actually stains the bushes but this particular tree has not even one I think what I'm going to do Next is I'm going to go and visit that massive boar bean tree on that massive termite mound at the junction with the chele pan and weaver's nest and see if perhaps a termite colony with access to better water may have different. Maybe we can see some buds, but this absolutely has nothing. Uh, Brent has just asked me to keep an eye out for you for that white-throated robin that he's been looking for. I absolutely will Brent. I mean they are quite difficult birds to find. I know why Brent wants to see one is because they are quite special to see especially around these areas. So I've got some sunbirds and I have some go away birds that are around but nothing much. We will absolutely have a better chance of seeing that white-throated robin when this particular boar bean starts to flower which will be it doesn't look like any time soon. It's interesting, you know, every single year out here brings with it a different thing. Brings with it a different insect that's a plague. This year it's been flies and for the last year it's been flies. Other times there'll be these little stink bugs or spiders or you name it. What happens out here is every single year there'll be something or other that gives us a different surprise and has a different, a different epidemic to it or feel to it at least. Anyway, it's not really an epidemic but it just feels like it. There's a brown hooded kingfisher and we've got in the branch right there, there you go, over there in the middle, brown hooded kingfisher. So unlike the, the woodland kingfisher, this particular bird although has that blue, it's a, it's a slightly darker blue on the wing and not as much of it and then it has a beak that is red and red at the top and red at the bottom, not red and black like the 
woodland kingfisher and then although it has got an eye stripe it's not that mask that the woodland kingfisher has coupled with the fact that this one doesn't migrate away so this one is sedentary it's not nomadic and there he goes oh he's in the sun now let's see if we can get him there and they are they called they have a catholic diet is how they describe it this little kingfisher will eat anything from lizards to snakes from frogs to tadpoles mice all the way through to anything that it can catch and kill this little bird and then he flies away obviously doesn't want to be filmed too much anyway at least we got to see him which was quite nice so these little birds don't go anywhere woodland kingfisher we expect back around about November end of November beginning of December all right so no luck in the Mulwati in this particular area for weeping boar bean so Raisa we're still on the look out for that particular tree but what I am going to do is see if we can go through to Chele Pan before the end of the drive and while I get there I'm going to send you back through to some lion cubs which are busy trying to inhale a buffalo Well, they're doing a pretty good job some of them have already eaten their full and have just passed out like this little guy here and the others there's two cubs still feeding and one lioness the rest have spread out now, at the moment I can only see there's the male I can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven cubs and one lioness. Two lioness, sorry, I'm missing one lioness. But I'm sure she's sleeping around here close by. Or she might have headed towards three in a row pan for a drink. Oh, complaining, don't come eat near me. There's some serious attitude amongst these little sticks cubs. Now you can see that little one is there where the male opened up. Oh, she's trying to put it into the shade. Bit too heavy for her by herself. Justin's wondering, would lions eat till they make themselves sick? Sometimes. Oh, oh, hello. There's that little one with the very tatty ears. Apparently it's been nicknamed Mandlev, which means ears. Oh, look at that. Look how strong she is. Still not quite able to pull it into the shade by herself, or maybe she'll succeed. <laughs> the little one just hanging on. Bush mum is wondering why the lions haven't opened up this buffalo fully yet. Well, it's probably because I think they had a kill yesterday, so they're not too hungry. You can see from their bellies, although these little cubs, you would swear they were starving the way they're behaving. So, oh, look at that. Wow, he's actually quite high. Sorry, I was watching the lions on the kill. And look at that little cub right up a little bush willow tree, just for fun.
But this little one with the tatty ears has managed to almost get underneath. Okay, well we're going to stay with the lines, but Steph would like to bid you adieu, so let's go see him quickly. That is exactly what I'd like to do. So we've got something to come to this afternoon. We didn't quite get out to that uh, that weeping boar bean as quickly as what I thought we were going to. But nevertheless, it leaves something exciting to look for this afternoon. But from myself, Steph, and from Dave, we just want to say thank you very, very much for joining us this morning. All your questions and comments always such a pleasure. Have a good day wherever you are. See you again at three o'clock. So it's definitely been a line filled day. We started off with the 15 lions on Juma, the five in Kahumas, eight cubs and two Birmingham's. And now we're ending with uh, the eight sticks cubs, one Birmingham and three lioness. So what's that total there, Liam? I think that could be a record. For one, one day, a Safari Live record. So we've got 15 uh, with Inkahumas and Birmingham, so one more Birmingham, 16, plus three lionesses, were 19, 19, and then uh, eight more cubs, maths is not, 27, 27 lions in a drive. Wow, not bad going. That little one has really just got right in there. I think Gavin is a spot on there. He says the sticks are definitely not the do not have the privilege of beauty, but these little cubs will be very good scrappers when they grow up. And sometimes that's better than being beautiful, knowing how to hold yourself in a fight. has been an absolutely splendid uh, sunrise safari. Thanks for joining us. It's been great having you on the back. And as I said, what a lion-filled morning. 27 different lions today. And uh, well, we're gonna have to make some choices for the sunset safari, where to go. Uh, thanks for all the questions and uh, comments. We really do appreciate them. But from all of us here at Safari Live, um, we're about to leave. So I'm gonna keep chatting to you, but let's look at the lions Look at that little one, he's really got stuck in, whole head inside that buffalo cow's, well, what would be her mouth, where the male has eaten the tongue already. So, from the sticks, cubs, and us, adieu till this afternoon.